episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another fascinating guest who is uh, helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we're honored to be joined by Dr. David Glansman, who is professor in the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology at UCLA College of the Life Sciences, a professor in their Department of Neurobiology in the David Geffen School of Medicine, and a member of the Brain Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Glansman has uh, both a bachelor's and a PhD in psychology, a bachelor's from Indiana University of Bloomington, his PhD from Stanford. Uh, and his lab is interested in the cell biology of learning and memory in simple organisms, and their research focuses specifically uh, on two animals, uh, the marine stale uh, Aplysia californica, uh, which is an invertebrate with a, uh, a fairly simple nervous system, about 20,000 neurons, that provides a very valuable experimental model for understanding the cellular mechanisms that underlie uh, simple forms of learning, including habituation, sensitization, uh, conditioning, uh, as well as the zebrafish, Dario Rario, uh, which has been used extensively extensively uh, in studies of developmental biology, but whose uh, significant advantages for uh, both genetic and molecular studies of behavior, uh, including studies of learning and memory, are being discovered uh, by Dr. Glansman's lab. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Glansman, thank you for taking the time to come on the show today and talk to us for a little while. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Now, it's great to have you. Uh, you know, typically, we start things off by handing our guests the floor just for a little bit to uh, talk about themselves. Um, if you could sort of take us back to the beginning uh, of, uh, you know, basically sort of where you grew up, how you developed some of these interests. And if you could just tell me a little bit about how somebody that was originally interested in English and film and, and being a silkscreen printer uh, ultimately decided to ah. study the intricacies of the, of the, of the human mind. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, um, I started I started off college, uh, well, I'm from the Midwest. I was born in Ohio and uh, uh, went to high school in Indiana. And I started out in college at Oberlin and I was interested in um, English and film. And particularly, I was interested in being uh, a filmmaker. I, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't want to be a, uh, a Hollywood style filmmaker. I wanted to be an underground filmmaker and that was a sort of poor career choice <laughs> because um, I didn't realize that that I wouldn't be it would uh, it would uh, be um, difficult to get people to give me tens of thousands of dollars to make my own small personal film. So eventually, uh, I dropped I dropped out of college and I went to New York and I worked uh, as a silkscreen printer, as you say, and I also worked as a messenger boy for a trailer house. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, learning how to edit, but eventually I decided that um, this was not the way I wanted to go. And I decided to go back to college. And um, at that point, my father said, well, you, you know, you're a college dropout. I'm not gonna spend any more money for you to go to a fancy private school. So you could go to a state school. And that actually turned out to be great. I went to Indiana University and I got interested in psychology. And uh, at first I wanted to be a clinical psychologist, but uh, the longer I was in it, I decided, no, I'm really interested in cognitive psychology. So I went to graduate school to study uh, cognitive psychology. I went to Stanford. And after about a year or so, I, I sort of got... Um, discouraged with cognitive psychology at the time. So we're talking in the late uh, 70s because it was very divorced from the brain. And I decided that until we understood more about the brain, uh, we weren't really gonna be able to understand these cognitive processes. And most of the people that I knew in psychology at that time could care less about the brain. Um, and so I started, uh, one of the great things about Stanford was that they gave you almost total freedom to do whatever you wanted. And the idea would be that you would spend it doing research. Well, 
after I took my required courses, I decided that I would start taking courses in neuroscience. So I got interested in neuroscience. I started taking courses and I was totally unprepared uh, for these courses because um, I had no little biology or little chemistry. So um, I spent about four years always feeling like the dumbest guy in the room, but eventually I succeeded in doing a PhD in neuroscience. And then at the end of my graduate career, I got interested in learning and memory. So, um, and I was particularly interested in learning in simple systems. So I decided to study um, uh, an invertebrate. And I went to UCLA and did a postdoc in the laboratory of Frank Krasny, who's a colleague of mine here now. And I worked on learning in crayfish. And then I went to work uh, with uh, doing a postdoc, another postdoc with Eric Kandel at Columbia University. And it was there that I began my work uh, on the studies of aplesia and learning and memory and aplesia, which of course was pioneered by Kandel and for which he got the Nobel Prize in 2000. So since that time, um, after I finished my postdoc at Columbia, I, I got a job at UCLA and I've been here ever since for the last 30 years. And I've been studying the role um, of synaptic plasticity in learning and memory. So that's what I was been engaged in for most of my career. And uh, recently, however, I've sort of, uh, switch directions once more, and I've gotten into non-synaptic mechanisms of learning and memory. So um, I've reached the conclusion rather late in life that uh, memories are not stored uh, as um, long-term synaptic changes. So I've been working in this field for 35 years and for about 32 of those years, I firmly believed in the synaptic model of learning memory, but uh, my findings and research gradually convinced me that that model was wrong. And since that time, I've been focused on trying to understand, um, trying to show and trying, and if so, trying to understand how nuclear mechanisms might store memories. And in the course of this work, we did an experiment that got a lot of attention, mm -hmm. which is we, um, we thought, well, okay, if, if memories are stored in the nucleus, then how might they be stored? And one way they might be stored is by nuclear changes, epigenetic changes, or possibly even genomic changes that are induced by RNA. And so what we did was we trained aplesia, and I can go into the details of the training um, if you wish, but we trained aplesia on a task called sensitization, where aplesia are given a series of electrical shocks and it makes them, uh, it, uh, makes them hyper reflexive to stimuli. And then we dissected out their nervous systems and we extracted the RNA from their nervous systems. And then we injected the RNA from the trained animals into a group of naive aplesia, aplesia that hadn't been trained. And what we found is that they behaved like animals that had received, been trained with tail shocks. That is, mm -hmm. their reflexes were enhanced. And just to show that the response was, this effect was specific, we took a group of aplesia that weren't given sensitization training, they didn't get the tail shocks, and we injected RNA from those animals into a, another group of naive untrained aplesia, and we didn't see any behavioral change in those animals. So um, we, we believe that what these results show is that learning is encoded as a, um, a molecular RNA-induced change in the animal's nervous system. Now, 
We don't know what the RNA is, the specific RNA. We don't know that. We're trying to understand that. And we also don't know what are the nuclear changes that are induced. Um, so that's work that we're trying to pursue now. Mm -hmm. And just for the, the audience, and, and there's, there's, you've published a bit on this, but the, I think the, uh, the hot paper uh, from 2018 was uh, entitled RNA from trained aplesia can induce epigenetic yeah. engram from long-term sensitization yeah. in untrained aplesia. And then there's the, uh, another paper that I found fascinating, which are the, the, your 2019 paper, you sort of sum up uh, is plasticity of synapses the mechanism of long-term memory storage where you go right. into this theme of cell intrinsic memory. Um, right. Could you just take us back for a minute and and because we, we talked a bit about zebrafish on the show in the past. Could you just, um, sorry, give us a short lecture on aplesia in general, uh, you know, what the, sure. the species is and why, sure. because you don't hear about it that much, but so why yeah. it is so useful for this particular type of study. Right, so um, yeah, people, it's hard for people that aren't familiar with the field to understand why would you be interested in learning memory in snails? Right. And um, when I was first a postdoc, my relatives, my aunts and uncles would ask me, why are you studying learning in snails? Why don't you study learning in people? So I try to explain it to them, and then they would say, just let me know, are my tax dollars paying for you to study learning and memory in snails? Yeah, and, I have to, and I have to say yes. Um, so I was always worried that they were going to write their congressman and say, don't give my nephew any money. Um, so the reason, so Aplesia, to back up a little bit, Aplesia is a gastropod mollusk. It uh, is a marine snail, it lives in the ocean, and uh, it, most of its life consists of eating seaweed. So it, it grows from about this size to about this size in a year. And it's, it lives for a year in the ocean. The species we use is from the water, the coastal waters of uh, Southern California. Mm -hmm. So we use Aplesia californica. And the reason why many neurobiologists who study memory are interested in this animal goes back to the pioneering work of Kandel and his colleagues. And they, at the time that Kandel began work on learning memory in this animal, uh, very little was known about the cell biology of learning and memory. And Kendall was interested in that. He was trained as a psychiatrist. In fact, uh, he initially started working doing cellular electrophysiological experiments in the hippocampus of mammals. And the reason for that is at the time it was known that the hippocampus is an important structure for memory. But Kendall became discouraged about the idea of trying to rigorously demonstrate that changes in the hippocampus were, um, were, the, uh, were the basis of memory in a mammal. He just thought the nervous system was too complicated. And of course, the experimental techniques were cruder back in those days. I mean, we had intracellular electrophysiological recording, but there was no optogenetics and no genetic manipulation was possible. So he looked around for a simpler organism and he came across research that was being done in France actually on aplesia. And he was very uh, intrigued by this animal because it had a relatively simple nervous system. So unlike a mammal, which has uh, hundreds of millions of neurons, uh, Aplesia only has 20,000. Mm -hmm. And the other advantage was that the neurons were big. And so whereas a mammalian neuron, maybe 10 microns, 20 microns or so, uh, on average, in aplesia, some of these neurons were 100 microns in diameter, 50 microns in diameter. There's one that's a millimeter in diameter. So that made electrophysiological experiments feasible. 
So you could record from effectively a behaving animal using intracellular recording. So he was very attracted by that. And then the, th the, the third advantage was that a plesia have what are so called what are called identified neurons, which means that there have been hundreds of neurons, perhaps thousands that have been identified in the animal's nervous system. So by that, I mean, we know uh, what, their, what their neurotransmitters are. We know uh, what their behavioral or physiological functions are. And to a first approximation, we know what their synaptic connections are. So this makes it much easier to relate changes in um, the neurobiology of the animal to behavioral changes. And so by leveraging these advantages, Kandel and his colleagues were able to show really for the first time that indeed synaptic changes were um, related. He could draw direct relationships between synaptic changes in aplesia and learn behavioral changes. And that had never been done before. And it still remains one of the major advantages of aplesia, the simplicity of its nervous system, the fact that it has identified neurons makes it much easier to draw relationships, functional relationships between cellular changes in the animal's nervous system and learn behavioral changes. The final advantage of aplesia is that you can take out identified neurons from its nervous system, put them into cell culture, and they will reform their synaptic connections. Mm -hmm. And so now you can study uh, learning related synaptic plasticity in the dish. And what's nice about that is that these aren't because um, because you can always go back and forth between the dish and the animal, you can verify that the learning related synaptic changes that you're seeing in the dish are actually occurring during learning in the animal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, this is still a major advantage of aplesia. You can study long-term memory in the dish effectively, looking at changes that let persist for days in cell culture. So this, is, this has been um, one of the major, this has proved to be one of the major advantages of aplesia. And many of the discoveries that are regarded as fundamental to learning memory for specifically the role of um, Kreb in uh, long-term memory and the role of, um, and also synap synaptic specificity in memory. Many of those fundamental discoveries were made on aplesia synapses in mm -hmm. culture. And obviously the, when you um, take out the, the RNA or the, the milieu uh, within one aplesia. That, obviously, that's a um, a very, I guess, a complex cocktail of biochemical stuff. Yes. Um, yes. What What are some of the? Obviously, you can go in a lot of different directions with this. Um, yeah. What What are some of the next steps? Is, is it really to to look at sort of the the combinatorial mix that you have there? Is there a place for? I, I, I mean, I, I, this it's, I'm outside of the sphere here, but uh, is this too complex for uh, you know the typical uh, type of sort of protein uh, RNA analysis, the need sort of artificial intelligence tool. Like, what do you need to say? Well, let me. What's in that well, memory the, cocktail? The the um, the analysis is fairly straightforward. It, <laughs> it basically requires time and money. Okay. But uh, what you would like to do is do something called RNA seq okay. on the RNA. So determine the species of RNA that are memory uh, inducing, as mm -hmm. it were, um, mnemonic, the, the mnemonic RNA. And as you say, um, this is a, you know, to use a technical term, this is a big gamish of molecules. I like gamish, gamish is a good word. <laughs> yeah. Cocktail. So, so RNA-seq allows you to 
refine the analysis. So you would sort, and there are many different types of RNA. So most people are familiar with messenger RNA, which is involved in translation of DNA into protein. Yep. But there are many other species of, of so-called, those are called, uh, that's called coding RNA or messenger RNA. Yep. There are many species of RNA that are non-coding and we're just beginning to understand their role in uh, various functions. So it's a very hot area of investigation. So we believe that the mnemonic RNA are likely to be non-coding RNA. Um, and so by using RNA-seq, we can take RNA from trained animals and uh, untrained animals and do differential expression analyses to try to see which RNAs are up, the expression of which are species of RNA are upregulated with learning. Perhaps there are others that are downregulated. And then try to use those data to test specific species of RNA to, you know, inject specific types of RNA into a plesia and look to see if that induces the change. Now, one of the things that makes this whole process very complicated and is that learning is by no means a simple biological process. And whenever you train an animal, you are actually inducing several different types of train of learn of behavioral changes mm -hmm. and which behavioral change ultimately is a, gets expressed is a complicated issue. So for example, early on in my career, I was trying to study the role of serotonin in sensitization in aplesia. And I was finding that when I shocked the animal, instead of seeing sensitization of the of a reflex, I was seeing inhibition of that mm. reflex. Okay. And so that was a bit, you know, I thought I was doing something wrong because mm. the, you know, people always say when you shock the animal, you get sensitization. So I was asking my, uh, the people, and this is when I was a postdoc, I was asking people in Eric's lab, what's going on here? What am I doing wrong? And it turned out that in fact, you always get inhibition mm -hmm. of the re reflex, but it's, it's short-lived. And unless you sample at the correct time, you will miss it. And so, so if let's say you wanted to extend that analysis to RNA, well, if you shock the animal, you're gonna get some, if you think the memory is due to RNA, you're gonna get some species of RNA that are inhibitory and some species of RNA that produce um, enhanced reflexes. And how are you gonna know which is which? Right. The only way you can do that is screen the RNA. And learning is not in, I would be willing to say that almost every type of learning involves an opposite uh, process. And which one wins out is a complicated issue. And when, when you do, uh, sort of RNA molecular analysis, you're going to see both processes or several, you may well see uh, evidence of several processes going on. And so you're going to have to refine your analysis and keep that um, in the, you know, you're going to have to sure. think about that. And in fact, um, you may be familiar, many, uh, there were many studies of the type that we did that were done back in the 60s and 70s where people would train animals and they would extract RNA, uh, RNA or they would extract, uh, they would use brain extracts and inject them into animals. And many people reported that there, many labs reported that they were able to see evidence of memory transfer, but uh, other labs were unable to see that. And some labs reported that they would see uh, they would see two types of changes when they mm -hmm. injected the brain extract. They would see the learning or they would see the inhibition of learning. 
but they wouldn't see nothing. And when they injected the control RNA, they saw no changes. Okay. So, they, so that led people to think, well, this there's something very, uh, that, that made people skeptical of the results. But in fact, if you, if you actually look at the results it, in light of the knowledge we have today, it makes perfect sense that you sure. would see that. And, uh, you know, I, I happen to be, I, I have it around here somewhere, but I have a copy of uh, Paul Pisch's, uh book, Shuffle Brain, uh, somewhere, uh, which I, I don't know if you guys overlapped at all at, in Indiana when you were there, but uh, obviously, you know, he did a lot of this brain switching stuff with frogs and salamanders and all that. It just, it, I guess, first silly question of the day. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've done this, great. If not, whatever. But it's a thought experiment. If you take a um, a plesia gamish, and it, okay, we have a mollusk here. If you put it into an octopus, uh, does the octopus act like a, a snail? <laughs> or, any, any, I, I don't know if you've done this, anything like this, or this is just. Yeah. So that that's that's a terrific question. So so, all right. So now we're going to get into some bio. You know. Biology, real, <laughs> real biology. Please take us there. Uh, oh, it's good. So let's let's think about uh, the evolution of learning. Yep. All right. So how long has learning been around in evolutionary terms? Most neurobiologists, if you ask them, would say, "Well, the answer to that is how long have there been nervous systems?" So mm -hmm. five hundred million years, something like that. But there's increasing evidence yep. for learning in animals or not animals, but organisms that don't have nervous system. Yep. And you may be familiar with the work of Audrey Dussouteur in Toulouse, who looks at learning in slime molds. Yep. yep. And there's, there are reports of learning in plants. So the question is, uh, did learning antedate the appearance of the nervous system in evolution. And I would argue that it did. So when the nervous system came along, there are two possible ways it could have gone. It could have invented a whole new memory system, even though there'd been a perfectly good one that had existed for hundreds of millions of years, right. or it could have a piggybacked, adapted itself into this pre-nervous system, pre-neural memory, yeah. and go from there. And my guess is, just thinking about the way evolution works, is the latter is the case. So I believe that neural organisms have conserved this non-neural, effectively a nuclear memory system, and they use synaptic plasticity not to store memory, but to express memory. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then that argues that the uh, mechanisms, these molecular mechanisms are going to be similar uh, across species. Uh, and there is evidence, these, during, when people did these experiments that I talked about, they found evidence for cross-species transfer of memory. So there was an experiment where I believe they trained rats and then took out brain extracts and injected it into hamsters okay. and found that they could, um, that they found evidence of memory transfer. I I'm, I'm, can't remember which task they were looking at. Uh, an octopus is a mollusk, okay? Uh, it's basically an aplesia with a huge brain. Yeah. And a lot of arms. A lot of arms. And uh, so I would absolutely expect that if we were able to identify mnemonic RNA from a plesia and we injected that into the octopus, that we would see behavioral changes in the octopus that resemble those in a plesia. Now, you have to understand the the octopus is a totally different organism, so it has arms and stuff. But let's say we, for the sake of argument, that we sensitized an aplesia using electrical shocks. Mm -hmm. And we were, we, we were able to succeed and identify the RNA that induced that change. Yep. 
we injected it into an octopus, I would bet a fair amount of money that the octopus would show hyperreflexia, would show evidence of sensitization. That, that would be, you know, that would be a great experiment to do. Now, the question is, what if you injected it into a rat? Would you see the same thing? Well, there, I, I would be less, like, less confident that you would. And that's because the RNA is over evolution, you know, the, the species of RNA shows some ev evolutionary change. And so uh, where you might get the right general species of RNA, the specific uh, uh, amino acid sequences might be sufficiently different that you wouldn't be able to transfer the memory that way. I mean, it would be something you just have to look at, just have to test. But, but I would say the species would be the same. Got it, got it. And also you'd have to look at the same, you'd have to be interested in the same kind of memory. There, if you're interested in memorizing, you know, learning Shakespeare, you're not gonna get that from a plesia. <laughs> you, so a plesia have habituation, sensitization, classical conditioning, operant conditioning. It'd have to be one of those four. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. No, I, I appreciate that, and I have, yeah. Apologize for the not the silly nature of the question, but I, you know, I. Uh, it's not a silly question. Thank it's you. not a silly question. Thank you. And and, and I don't know if you said about a couple of weeks ago, I had Mike Levin from Tufts on talking about yes. slime mold. So yeah, uh, there's you know a lot of this fits together really nicely, and I'm yes. I, I'm really enjoying the theme. But where now I yes. want to go with you, uh, continuing along that line, is so, um, you know, we, we have these experiments. Uh, you know, we talked about sort of the folks that were around before nervous systems and around before neurons. Um, okay, the, those, those non-excitable tissues are capable of doing a lot of stuff. Uh, where Mike Levin takes us, and I, I'm gonna go with you in this direction now, uh, the species whose brains fall apart, <laughs> yet somehow memory comes back. The, uh, the planarian and the amphibians whose brain you can rip to hell and yes. they regenerate. Um, we, you've taken us from synaptic plasticity model to the cell intrinsic model, but boom, now there's no brain and the brain is reforming thoughts, ideas on other tissues. <laughs> if we don't have a brain there or the brain is, you know, 90% destroyed and now it's coming back. So obviously the synapses have been destroyed. A lot of the cell commission has gone away other reservoirs of the cell intrinsic memory that maybe communicate with the nervous system in, yeah. in, in more sophisticated mo models. Right. So, so, uh, so Mike has published a review article on this topic and it's a terrific article. Um, and one of the cases he discusses is work that was done on uh, a moth. And of course, moths start out life as caterpillars. Mm -hmm. So, so you can train a, a caterpillar to evoke to avoid an odor, and then let it go through pupation, and it'll turn into a moth. The moth will avoid that odor. Now, you might think, well, so what? But if you look at the nervous system of the caterpillar mm -hmm. and the nervous system of the moth it undergoes radical changes. It's, it's radically changed. It's radically different. So the, so the question is, how does the memory persist? And another example in that article are hib hibernating ground squirrels. Mm -hmm. So when gra uh, ground squirrels, there are species of ground squirrels that hibernate. When they hibernate, they lose something like 30% of the synaptic connections in their brains. And within a few hours after they wake up, those connections from hibernation, those connections are restored. So the question is, well, if you lose 30% of your synapses in the hippocampus, that's effectively Alzheimer's. That's like, you know, what happens during Alzheimer's, at least the initial stages. So they should have terrible memories. But as far as anyone can tell, it doesn't affect stored memories, at least the evidence is that it doesn't. Okay, so then what's going on? How is the memory preserved in the absence of 
these synaptic connections. And my and so the the idea of nuclear memory uh, allows you to explain that. So if the memory is back in the neurons, then the neurons should be able to regenerate the appropriate synaptic connections. And that will uh, allow the animal to express the memory, which is not to say that the, the memory is not there. It's still there, but it's back in the nuclei of neurons. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, how does the, how does the nucleus of a neuron know where to put that synaptic connection? And that's a fantastic question, which we, you know, people who believe what I believe haven't solved. But there's recent evidence from the work of um, Vivian Budnick and Drosophila and Jason Shepard in mice that neurons exchange mRNA with each other and maybe other types of RNA. And uh, what they found was that there's a, a synaptic protein called ARC, which is a protein that whose expression is increased with neuronal activity, and it's involved in stabilizing postsynaptic receptors at synapses. But what the Shepard lab and the Budnick lab found is that ARC, the structure of ARC, uh, is identical to the structure of reverse um, um, uh, viruses that, uh, that use reverse transcriptase, uh, such as COVID, for example. Mm -hmm. So they have, the protein has this particular capsid-like structure. And what they found is if you look inside the ARC protein, what you see is RNA. Mm -hmm. They also found that neurons release these ARC proteins, RNA-containing proteins, by through exosomal release. So the proteins are packaged in exosomes. Okay. Then the exosomes get released from the neurons, and they get taken up by neurons in the vicinity. Okay, so this is a non-synaptic mechanism of neuronal communication where a neuron, neurons are exchanging RNA with each other. Now ask yourself, why should neurons do that? For example, they found that the uh, capsid contains um, mRNA for ARC, but my guess is that's not all that it contains. It probably contains other types of RNA. Now, what is the function of those other types of RNA? Well, it could be identity. In other words, it could be that if I get RNA from you, that, sir, that helps me to identify you as a potential partner. So mm -hmm. let's say you and I were involved in some learning, okay? I want to keep, I want to keep that information. And one way to keep it, of course, is synaptic. But what if the synapses are destroyed for whatever reason? Well, maybe this exchange of RNA keeps our relationship, uh, the knowledge of our relationship preserved. Right. It preserves that knowledge. And so we have no idea why neurons are exchanging RNA. It seems unlikely to me, but it's possible that the mRNA is the whole story because after all, what do I need with your ARC mRNA? I already have the gene. For, I, don't, I already got my own ARC mRNA. So, I mean, it's, you know, there, it could have another function, but my guess is that there are other species of RNA in these capsids, and those other species of RNA have functional uh, um, uh, information, and it may be information that allows neurons to preserve the knowledge of network partnerships okay. in the absence of synaptic connections. And so, so for the last hundred years, neuroscience has focused on synaptic communication. And that's right. great. But I think that that's only part of the story. True. I think 
I look upon, you know, I start out life as a psycholinguist. So I relate this to linguistics. So I think of synaptic communication is like the Chomsky and surface structure of language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I look upon this exchanging of RNA as the, the deep structure. So that's the deep communication, perhaps. Fascinating. Really fascinating. So it could be that the next hundred years, we're going to be focused on how neurons communicate with each other without synapses through this exchange of RNA. Now, the, one of the interesting questions is one, what types of RNA are in the arc capsid? Two, um, do they go into the nucleus and are they reverse transcribed in the nucleus like viruses are reverse transcribed? Hmm. So you have, you have the RNA, it gets into the, the uh, downstream neuron, it gets transported to the nucleus, does it then get reverse transcribed and into the, into the genome of mm. the downstream nucleus? That's a, that's a very important question. And then the third question that is really important is, ARC, is ARC the only uh, protein like this? Is, are there other proteins that have this capsid-like structure, other synaptic proteins that also contain RNA and that are released exosomally and are taken up by neighboring neurons? That's a, a terrific question. And that's something that I'm sure people are looking at right now. But if, think about this, just like a, um, virus that used an RNA type virus. Mm -hmm. It depends on getting the RNA into the nucleus of cells and then using reverse transcriptase to get inserted into the DNA of the cells. And then that cell starts churning out new viruses. Okay, maybe ARC acts like that. And so if it does, what that means is that your nucleus may have a record of the activity of my, of my, of mm -hmm. me, because that activity is reflected in the release of arc. Mm -hmm. And then the arc, perhaps this is, you know, sheer speculation but that's what these interviews are for. So it's fun. It's fun. Might as well. So maybe that will, that will produce a change in my genome. Your activity will produce a change in my, that is potentially a way where your activity will change my genome. I mean, that's, uh, it, it's, it's not so far fetched. I mean, that's the, uh, you know, there's this whole domain of so called inner kingdom signaling now, semiochemical communications, how plants communicate with bugs and so forth, and how, yeah, one genome can affect the genome well, another there's, genome's distance. There's, there's, there's something that is getting a lot of attraction, a lot of attention called somatic mosaicism. Uh, sure. And what people are finding is that neurons in different regions of the brain are genomically different. Yep. They're, they're genomically distinct. Okay, pardon me, why? Why are they genomically distinct? Is experience part of that reason? And the other question, just like the neurons of aplesia have Neurons of aplesia are identified. Many of them are unique. Maybe that's true in our brains too, but we just don't have the, you know, they're not, they're not grossly unique the way of aplesia uh, neurons are, but maybe genetically they're unique. Maybe every neuron in your brain is somewhat genetically different due to your individual experience. Fascinating. Really fascinating. I, I love talking to people like you, Dave, because it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, these are these are the big ideas. <laughs> these are the big things we got to solve. And yeah, yeah and well, I, I wish I wish I wish NIH agreed with you. But unfortunately, I, I know that story. It doesn't. <laughs>
<laughs> well, hopefully we get the word out and, you know, the sky will open up and a trillion dollars falls out because these are the these are the types of things that we really need to, these are the frontiers. Uh, I don't yeah. really, I'm not interested in going to Mars. Um, uh, this is, you know, a real frontier and it's, it's really exciting. And just hearing your, um, your ideas on the matter, it's just, it's really fascinating work. Um, any, thank you. thank you. any big sort of, obviously we're still in a, in a, in a pandemic, but anything yeah. hot happening in the next six months, a uh, year that you can talk about, Plans, uh, I'm uh, very. I, I can't really discuss this in detail, but I'm I'm very interested in the possibility that genomic changes mm -hmm. are involved in learning. So up, up until now, I focused my thinking on epigenetic changes, yep. but I'm increasingly attracted to the idea that there are genomic changes mm -hmm. that are involved in long-term memory storage and. If that's the case, then um, if you think about uh, memory disorders like Alzheimer's, dementia, mm -hmm. I really strongly believe that at, at one time we are going to be able to restore memory. And that's one of the things that happens early on in Alzheimer's is there's destruction of synaptic connections. And that's associated with memory loss. But I think that we're going to, if we understand the nuclear changes, some of which are genomic, we should be able to regenerate those neuronal connections and restore people's memory. Now, after the neurons die, that's a whole different situation. That, that then, of course, you're not going to be able to restore the memory. But certainly, I think that that would offer hope for the early stages of Alzheimer's. Right. So if you think about it, it's kind of like uh, infantile amnesia. So one of the big, one of the questions that's been around for years, decades, you know, centuries almost, is why is it that you don't remember anything that happened to you uh, before the age of three? Yeah, why is and that? so there are all sorts of, there are all sorts of ideas. One is that, well, infants don't have very good, they don't have long-term memory, so it doesn't get stored. That turns out to be wrong. Freud, of course, had the idea that your early memories are sexually charged, so you're, you're, um, so they're being repressed. I don't know how many people buy into that argument, but the other idea is that they're there, but at some point the synaptic connections that would allow you to retrieve the memory get lost. Mm -hmm. And if you could, so if you could identify those neurons that retain that memory, I think you could get it out. You could fish out the, the memories. And so one of the things that might happen one day is that we'll all be exposed to the memories of what happened to us right, you know, when we were infants, that's uh, that's that's a fascinating thought, and the same. Yeah, it, it's it, I, I'm thinking the other end of life now because I, I I've actually spoken to, you know in, in a few uh, cases to people, and this is sort of a diverse set of topics. But uh, it, I was talking someone on the topic of delirium uh, as well as uh, end of life uh, dreaming, and both people had experienced cases of the so-called uh, this uh, terminal lucidity in Alzheimer's patients, which is this bizarre, you know, thing where before they die, somehow everything comes back. And that's, uh, you know, who, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that could be a burst of uh, yeah. some, some nuclear, uh, as you were saying, some nuclear Or components. those neurons for whatever reason could get activated. Yeah, pretty wild. I think we're just really, at the early stages of understanding. Well, I, I'm glad that you know that you've done all this work so far, and that it's there, there's a place to now move on from. Uh, it's it's really it's amazing stuff. Um, Thank you, uh, David. I, I you know I, I typically do a wrap up question about uh, uh, you know for the our guest they that it's really going um. One direction, but I want to do something slightly different with you today because sure. I'm, I'm actually quite sure. intrigued, and I, I, I want to get, let's push all this neuro this neurology stuff on the side. Uh, any great films uh, that, you, that that 
that we've never heard of or uh, that uh, are somewhat. Thank, uh, uh, thank, well, so actually, did you make any that we uh, that maybe I should go look for? Uh, so tell <laughs> about what do you any suggestions? I, I love uh, bizarre sort of you know avant garde uh, yeah. stuff. So, so um, I'm still very fascinated with movies. I watch, my wife and I watch a lot of movies. Me too. And I have to say that my favorite movies now are coming out of China. Okay. So I think the Chinese are doing these incredible movies. There's a movie that came out called Ash is the Purest White. Okay. Uh, and I just, I just love these Chinese movies. They're, they're, I don't know, you know, I don't know how China, how these producers are able to, to make these movies in China given the political repression that's going on, maybe they can't anymore. Maybe these are movies that were made a few years ago and now the current government will crack down on it. But I just find those movies just really brilliant. And the other group of movies that I like very much are coming out of Romania. Okay. So Romanians are making some terrific movies these days. Um, I can't, you know, the director's <laughs> names are right. Romanian. So I'm not going to be able to get them off the top of my head. But so I, you know, I, I, I watch those movies quite a bit. And even, you know, if you think about uh, uh, Chinese movies, there's a director named Zhao, a woman director who was born in China, but came over and studied film in China, came over to the United States. And she's been making these gorgeous movies. One's called, uh, uh, so I think songs my brothers taught me, and then another that just came out was Ryder, mm -hmm. and she has a new film with Frances uh, McDormand called Nomadland, which is okay. just coming out, and she's a brilliant director, just really brilliant, and I think this is a great time for movies right now, and and, and what you're seeing is, you know, there's a lot of terrific American films, but now what we're seeing is like all these films coming from countries like China and Romania mm -hmm. and other parts of the world. And these people are doing great stuff. So mm -hmm. when I was young, I studied the French New Wave and the Italian, sure. you know, Antonioni and Fellini and those guys <laughs> and Godard and Truffaut and stuff. But, but now I think the energy is coming from some of these non-traditional countries where they're just, they're really making um, fantastic Films. So, and also there are films coming out of Korea that are great too. You know, mm -hmm. Korea is making great films. So, um, so those are the things that um, that I'm watching these days. It's uh, I have to check out some of those. But I, it's funny you mentioned you know uh, Romania because um, yeah, I'll, I'll pull I'll see something interesting on uh, on Netflix, Amazon Prime nowadays, and you know it's. Whatever it's supposed to be taking place in Boston. I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm saying, this is in Boston, and I, I'll look at the credits and you know, filmed in in Bulgaria or something. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's all, it's oh, all, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm not talking world. about the location. No, I, I, I'm I know. About the director. <laughs> right. No, no, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, anyway, well, I, it, it, it's really uh, been wonderful talking to you um, and hearing these the story, hearing about your work and, and really uh, wishing you the best with all of it going forward and Thank you. Uh, to have Thank this you. next sort of it's, generation. It's going to be hard. Let me tell you, it's a hard road to hoe to convince my colleagues of this. This is, this, yeah, this is, if I haven't made clear before now, this is a minority distinct. My ideas about memory are distinctly in the minority in the field. So, yeah, but but there's there's some pretty smart people that agree with you. So it's yeah. it's uh, I, I definitely think you're on the right path with this, and it's well, it's you. just really thank exciting. Um, for everybody that is uh, going to be listening to this uh, episode on our podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to Dr. David Glansman, Professor, Department of Integrated Biology and Physiology at UCLA College of Life Sciences. He's also a professor in the Department of Neurobiology at David Geffen School of Medicine and member of the Brain Research Institute. Uh, David, uh, just want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us, uh, for thanking you for everything you're doing. And as we say, uh, thank you for helping to create the better tomorrow through the knowledge that you're generating and all your work. It's, it's really uh, fascinating and, and, and 
it's an honor talking to you. That, thank you. Thank you, Ira. Thank you very much for your interest in our work. I, you know, I very much appreciate it. Most and definitely. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I've really enjoyed the interview a lot, quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you.